Today we're going to look at the topic of biological evolution and the Baha'i writings. In my experience of those who have looked at the writings, particularly of Abdu Baha, um, and Baha'is themselves reading our writings, um, there's a large divergence of understanding of what it is that the Baha'i writings are saying. Uh, very often I've encountered people who will claim that we have never been part of the animal kingdom, that man has always been separate, and that in some sense there has been a parallel evolution of, if you will, the lineage of humankind and the lineage of other biological organisms within the animal kingdom. Um, I've had so many different perspectives come, I wanted to do my best to try and do what we're about to see the Universal Laws of Justice has asked us to do, which is to look at the Baha'i writings as much as we can, and if, a, if we will, a broader scope, being more comprehensive, and looking at all these different facets of what particularly Abdul Baha, one of the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, has said, but not taking one piece and pitting it against another, or pitting it against uh, biological science in our day, but rather to try and take a broad perspective and try to bring all the writings as, that we can to bear on this subject. Uh, it's going to be a rather long <laughs> investigation, uh, but I hope you'll enjoy it. So we're going to start, actually, with a letter from the Universal House of Justice that was written in 2016 regarding the Baha'i writings and the topic of evolution. As you have observed, the purpose of the paragraph in question, which the House of Justice approved for inclusion in the foreword, does not limit how a Baha'i, as an individual, may personally choose to interpret the sacred writings. Yet, the paragraph does not insist that science is absolute truth, nor, as you seem to conclude, does it attempt to apologize for Abdu'l-Baha's statements. Rather, recognizing that he would not make a statement that contradicts reality, the paragraph encourages the friends to use all of the relevant texts on the subject, as well as the most accurate and reliable picture of reality that science can provide, to try to understand what Abdu'l-Baha is actually conveying. It is evident that there are instances throughout history when statements made in the sacred scriptures that conflicted with the scientific views of the time were confirmed by science itself centuries later. There also may well be statements in the writings about the material world, the veracity of which will be proven by science in future. The notion of scientific truth does not encompass every claim or theory asserted in the name of science. But while a great deal of scientific discourse is tentative and subject to change, some scientific statements are accurate and reliable descriptions of reality, and those findings are not in conflict with true religion that is, with the Revelation and its authorized interpretations. It is for this reason that Abdu'l-Baha emphasizes that religious beliefs should be weighed in the light of science and reason, so that personal interpretations of the meaning of the Revelation, which are also fallible and subject to change, do not lead to incorrect conclusions. The Master's statements on evolution are subtle and complex and must be understood within the context of the entirety of the Baha'i teachings, because his statements are both predicated upon and coherent with those teachings. In the passages found in some answered questions, as well as in numerous other tablets and talks, Abdu'l-Baha elaborates upon the principle of the harmony of science and religion, observes that human beings and animals have in common the same physical nature, emphasizes that it is the mind and the soul that distinguish humanity, and rejects the idea that human beings are merely animals, a haphazard accident, and captives of nature trapped in the struggle for existence. In light of all such statements, it is possible for a Baha'i to conclude that one can disagree with the materialistic philosophical interpretation of scientific findings, that man is merely an animal and a random expression of nature, without contesting the scientific findings themselves, such as those in genetics which are incompatible with a concept of parallel evolution. Of course, different individuals, using their rational powers to reach personal interpretations of scientific findings and the meaning of sacred texts, 
may come to different conclusions on different questions. This is the inevitable outcome of the independent investigation of truth. On certain matters, there may for a time be a degree of ambiguity. On others, an exchange of views conducted in a consultative spirit may make the truth evident. Yet, in their efforts to explore the ocean of Baha'u'llah's revelation, the House of Justice hopes that the friends will guard against two extremes. The first is to simply dismiss the truths found in the revelation, owing to a dogmatic attachment to materialistic interpretations of scientific findings. The second is to assume that in every instance where one's personal understanding of the teachings conflicts with scientific findings, it is these findings that must change in future, for such a posture would place Baha'is in the position of constantly contending with science. Both of these extremes are incompatible with the Baha'i principle of the harmony of science and religion. It says to use all of the relevant text on the subjects, on the subject, as well as the most accurate and reliable picture of reality that science can provide, in order to try to understand what it is that Abdu'l Baha is saying. And the Universal House of Justice notes that there are times in history when statements in the sacred scriptures conflicted with the scientific views of the time, but in the end were confirmed by science later. And it's important to emphasize that religious beliefs should be weighed in the light of science and reason. Uh, we've done a whole, if you will, topic on this entire presentation of the Baha'i writings on the brilliance and purity and beauty of the human intellect and how we are called to try to raise up ourselves to reach the heights of reason. And that it is actually the greatest gift from God to mankind is the intellect. Um, and we have to understand that when we're looking at the Baha'i writings, as it's said, stated in this letter, that we are interpreting all the time, every single one of us. That's why very often I will stress that this is my own personal perspective on this topic, and I'm doing my best to look at a large collection of writings in whatever the topics we're looking at on this site. Yet in the end it's my interpretation, it's my understanding of what is being said. I'm just trying to do my best to offer a perspective that I believe is relevant and very important at this time. In this letter it states that human beings and animals have in common the same physical nature, but that it emphasizes the mind and soul that distinguish humankind. That human beings are not merely animals, some hap and by that meaning a haphazard accident, and captives of nature, quote, trapped in the struggle of existence. So it's possible, as the house is saying, to disagree with materialistic philosophical interpretation of scientific findings without contesting the scientific findings themselves, such as those in genetics, and I quote here, again, which are incompatible with the concept of parallel evolution. And this is a topic I hope to go into much more deeply in the future, but oftentimes we'll get, say, a part of a scientific theory, and then on top of that we then hear the interpretation or the metaphysical implications that that theory has for the human condition. And because many of us don't move, for example, within the philosophy and history of science, we take one to be the other. By that I mean we take one scientist's interpretation of physics and its implications for human existence and human culture to be the scientific theory itself. And it's important to notice that those are not the same thing. So a great deal of science writing in the 20th century, and a great deal of public discourse, is not often not so much about the scientific theory itself as to what it implies, the philosophical implications or conclusions that another individual believes you should take from that scientific theory. And it's very important to understand that they are different, <laughs> that they are actually two different things. Philosophizing around scientific theories is even different than the philosophy of science. Um, so just keep an eye out for that when you're looking at, if you will, scientists speaking philosophically. <laughs> so in this letter, the House is asking us to guard against two extremes. The first, which is dis to dismiss the truths found in Revelation, and it says, owing to a dogmatic attachment to materialistic interpretations of scientific findings. 
that same concept again. But the second is to assume that in every instance where one's personal understanding conflicts with scientific findings, these findings must change in the future. This is why this concept of the difference between a scientific theory and interpretations that get surrounded or put on it, if you will, or garmented over it, is so unbelievably important, because we have to make sure that we understand what the science is as opposed to the philosophical interpretations that get put on top of it, because it may cause a knee reaction towards the undeniable scientific truth because we don't agree with the philosophical interpretations. And it says, interestingly, both of these extremes are incompatible with the Baha'i principle of harmony and science and religion. Now, this letter itself was actually incorporated into the new publication of the translation of Some Answered Questions. And Some Answered Questions is a text uh, of talks by Abdu'l-Baha where the subject of evolution repeatedly comes up. And a great number of the quotes that we're going to be looking at are from that work. Consider what it is that singles man out from among created beings, and makes of him a creature apart. Is it not his reasoning power, his intelligence? Shall he not make use of these in his study of religion? I say unto you, weigh carefully in the balance of reason and science everything that is presented to you as religion. If it passes this test, then accept it, for it is truth. If, however, it does not so conform, then reject it, for it is ignorance. When I look at this topic, and I see how, say, materialistic or atheistic friends of mine or non-religious individuals view the perspective of Abdu'l-Baha regarding evolution, and the often smaller sections of quotes that they've actually seen, there comes about a profound irony for me. And the irony is, is that people will often critique Abdu'l-Baha for a lack of knowledge, scientific knowledge, or a lack of reverence, therefore, for the scientific discoveries in the last century. And I find it ironic because when I read the writings of Abdu'l-Baha and the talks of Abdu'l-Baha, his central theme is actually the lack of our reverence for the scientific capacity of humankind. And I hope to bear this out throughout the talk. He's pointing to the fact that those who take a materialistic interpretation of evolution are themselves lacking in reverence and appreciation for the scientific faculty of humankind. And again, I hope to bear this out. In my interactions with fellow Baha'is and others who are familiar with some of the passages in the writings, of Ab writings and utterances of Abdu'l-Baha, um, I often hear the statement that man was never an animal. And this is what has led to this, if you will, uh, rejection, that one extreme of rejecting some of the sciences um, of biology. And people will then cling on to this concept, which is actually mentioned within the letter of the Universal House of Justice, of this concept of parallel, parallel evolution, where you have these, if you will, you know, two branches, where humankind was here and the rest of Kingdom Animalia was over here. Now there are passages where Abu'l-Bahá appears to be saying this on the surface, where he says that um, man was never an animal. But we have to look, again, at what that actually says. For now, I want to state that Abu'l-Bahá claims, or proclaims unequivocally, that mankind was in the animal kingdom. So we're going to start with some quotes. The first is from the Promulgation of Universal Peace. The spiritual blessings of God are greatest. When we were in the mineral kingdom, although we were endowed with certain gifts and powers, they were not to be compared with the blessings of the human kingdom. Um, this is actually rather peculiar on the surface, because not only does Abdu'l-Bahá state that we are in the animal kingdom, which we'll see in the next several passages, he states we were in the mineral kingdom. Now what that could mean, we're going to look into as we progress. The second quote is from Some Answered Questions itself. 
the human spirit may be likened to the bounty of the sun shining on a mirror. The body of man, which is composed from the elements, is combined and mingled in the most perfect form. It is the most solid construction, the noblest combination, the most perfect existence. It grows and develops through the animal spirit. So we were in the mineral kingdom, and the body, the physical temple of humankind, has grown and developed through the animal spirit. Again, from Promulgation of Universal Peace. Third, the human body has one form. In its composition, it has been transferred from one form to another, but never possesses two forms at the same time. For example, it has existed in the elemental substances of the mineral kingdom. From the mineral kingdom, it has traversed the vegetable kingdom and its constituent substances. From the vegetable kingdom, it has risen by evolution into the kingdom of the animal, and from thence attained the kingdom of man. After its disintegration and decomposition, it will return again to the mineral kingdom, leaving its human form and taking a new form unto itself. During these progressions, one form succeeds another, but at no time does the body possess more than one. It has risen, the body of man, it has risen by evolution into the kingdom of the animal and thence attained the kingdom of man. So once again, Abdu'l-Bahá is very clear that by evolution we came from the kingdom of animal and thence attained, and this is interesting, we attained the kingdom of man. Another quote. In the world of existence, man has traversed successive degrees until he has attained the human kingdom. In each degree of his progression, he has developed capacity for advancement to the next station and condition. While in the kingdom of the mineral, he was attaining the capacity for promotion into the degree of the vegetable. In the kingdom of the vegetable, he underwent preparation for the world of the animal, and from thence he has come onward to the human degree, or kingdom. Throughout this journey of progression, he has ever and always been potentially man. That man traversed successive degrees until he attained the human kingdom. And in the end of this quote it says, he underwent preparation for the world of the animal, in the kingdom of the vegetable, and from thence he has come onward to the human degree. So once again, Abdul Baha is very clear that humankind went through the passage of evolution through kingdom animalia. What is the purpose of our lives? Abdul Baha to acquire virtues. We come from the earth. Why were we transferred from the mineral to the vegetable kingdom, from the plant to the animal kingdom? So that we may attain perfection in each of these kingdoms, that we may possess the best qualities of the mineral, that we may acquire the power of growing as in the plant, that we may be adorned with the instincts of the animal and possess the faculties of sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste, until, from the animal kingdom, we step into the world of humanity and are gifted with reason, the power of invention, and the forces of the spirit. The question being asked here is, what is the purpose of life? Abdu'l-Bahá states, to acquire virtues, excellencies. We come from the earth. Why were we transferred from the mineral to the vegetable, from the plant to the animal kingdom? It's done. We have evolved in successive degrees, all the way from, if you will, the beginning of the globe, and we have traversed these stages. And then it says right at the end, until from the animal kingdom, we step into the world of humanity and are gifted with reason, the power of invention, and the forces of the spirit. So it's at this point we step into the world of humanity, and that comes with the gifts of reason, the power of invention, and the forces of the spirit. It is evident, therefore, that man is dual in aspect. As an animal, he is subject to nature, but in his spiritual or conscious being, he transcends the world of material existence. 
His spiritual powers, being nobler and higher, possess virtues of which nature, intrinsically, has no evidence. Therefore, they triumph over natural conditions. These ideal virtues or powers in man surpass or surround nature, comprehend natural laws and phenomena, penetrate the mysteries of the unknown and invisible, and bring them forth into the realm of the known and visible. All the existing arts and sciences were once hidden secrets of nature. By his command and control of nature, man took them out of the plane of the invisible and revealed them in the plane of visibility, whereas, according to the exigencies of nature, these secrets should have remained latent and concealed. According to the exigencies of nature, electricity should be a hidden, mysterious power. But the penetrating intellect of man has discovered it, taken it out of the realm of mystery, and made it an obedient human servant. In his physical body and its functions, man is a captive of nature. For instance, he cannot continue his existence without sleep, an exigency of nature. He must partake of food and drink, which nature demands and requires. But in his spiritual being and intelligence, man dominates and controls nature the ruler of his physical being. Notwithstanding this, contrary opinions and materialistic views are set forth which would relegate man completely to physical subservience to nature's laws. Now I want you to note how in this passage it opens. It is evident, therefore, that man is dual in aspect. As an animal, he is subject to nature. Okay? As an animal, he is subject to nature, so mankind is what? An animal. But in his spiritual or conscious being, he transcends the world of existence. So something to do with being a human is transcending the world of material existence. Somehow about not being subject to nature. Then it states these ideal virtues or powers a man surpass or surround nature comprehend natural laws and phenomena, penetrate the mysteries of the unknown and invisible, and bring them forth into the realm of the known and the visible. Then it goes through how all the arts and sciences were once hidden secrets, but how humankind, by utilizing his faculty of invention, the gift of reason, and these intellectual excellencies, is actually to re be able to reach in understand the laws of nature, and then overcome some of the natural, if you will, limitations of our physical body. We all know these, the ones even Abdul Baha was stating, as we're going to see, back in the 1910s, were actually submarines, the telegraph, the phonograph. They were scientific and technological achievements that enabled humankind to overcome his being wedded to the earth so he could fly. How humankind could actually soar beneath the waves, how we could speak across the planet. All of these things have increased exponentially since Abdu Baha's time. And these are themselves the area that Abdu Baha singles out, stating that these are the kingdom of man. These spiritual excellencies, as well as our intellectual excellencies. By but in his spiritual being and intelligence, man dominates and controls nature, the ruler of his physical being. I think in our day and age, it's so common to, and I know this is cliche, to take so many things for granted. For example, what is happening right now. How I'm actually able to record both my voice and actually my image and share digital products with my friends across the planet in an enormous global network of communication. This was utterly impossible, and to be told to someone, for example, a couple centuries ago, would be complete, utter, ridiculous science fiction and unbelievably utopian. So this faculty that humankind is able to summon in our penetrating the mysteries of the universe and drawing its secrets out is what Abdu'l-Bahá is stating is the kingdom of man. There are in the world of humanity three degrees. Those of the body, the soul, 
and spirit. The body is the physical, or animal, degree of man. From the bodily point of view, man is a sharer of the animal kingdom. The bodies alike of men and animals are composed of elements held together by the law of attraction. Like the animal, man possesses the faculties of the senses, is subject to heat, cold, hunger, thirst, etc. Unlike the animal, man has a rational soul, the human intelligence. So physically, our physical temple, we are animals who traversed the history of planet Earth through successive degrees, and man stepped out of the animal kingdom through the process of evolution, the term actually used. So we come now to function, not form, rational and spiritual man. Now, to be very clear, when I read the Baha'i writings regarding the topic of evolution, Abdu'l Baha is not giving a biological definition of humankind. He is not saying that man is not an animal in the sense that our physical bodies are not animals. He is claiming that what humanity is is a functionally defined thing. That is those ideal perfections and capacities of scientific exploration, of invention, and of the higher ethics and moralities of humankind. It is those facets that define what Abdu'l Baha means by the human kingdom. The reality of man is his thought, not his material body. The thought force and the animal force are partners. Although man is part of the animal creation, he possesses a power of thought superior to all other created beings. It's not his material body, right? Although man is part of the animal creation, he has the power of the intellect. Again, there are men whose eyes are only open to physical progress and to the evolution in the world of matter. These men prefer to study the resemblance between their own physical body and that of the ape, rather than to contemplate the glorious affiliation between their spirit and that of God. This is indeed strange, for it is only physically that man resembles the lower creation. With regard to his intellect, he is totally unlike it. Man is always progressing. His circle of knowledge is ever widening, and his mental activity flows through many and varied channels. Look what man has accomplished in the field of science. Consider his many discoveries and countless inventions, and his profound understanding of natural law. The power of the intellect is one of God's greatest gifts to men. It is the power that makes him a higher creature than the animal. For whereas, century by century and age by age, man's intelligence grows and becomes keener, that of the animal remains the same. They are no more intelligent today than they were a thousand years ago. He gets to this topic I brought up at the beginning, this peculiar irony. He says, There are men whose eyes are open only to physical progress and to the evolution of the world of matter. And he says this is strange, for it is, quote, only physically that man resembles the lower creation. With regard to his intellect, he is totally unlike it. And then again, look what man has accomplished in the field of science. Consider his many discoveries and countless intervention, inventions, and his profound understanding of natural law. So look at this again. What is Abdu Baha pointing at? He's saying, yes, we resemble animals. He's already told us that we were evolved. He has told us that we have come through successive stages and that what it means to step out of the animal realm is, here's the tag, the field of science, discoveries, inventions, and profound understanding of natural law. So he is juxtaposing this perspective of humankind saying, yes, physically, all that happened. Yet what is truly man is not his material body. It is this shocking, shocking capacity of humankind to penetrate 
the mysteries of creation, to understand the natural world, and to utilize that for unbelievable control and prediction within the physical world. He ends this quote, The power of the intellect is one of God's greatest gifts to men. It is the power that makes him a higher creature than the animal. Once again, this is a functional definition of what humankind is, saying that man as a kingdom is a rational being capable of scientific and intellectual discoveries. You cannot apply the name man to any being void of this faculty of meditation. Without it, he would be a mere animal, lower than the beasts. This faculty of meditation frees man from the animal nature, discerns the reality of things, puts man in touch with God. This faculty brings forth from the invisible plane the sciences and arts. Through the meditative faculty, inventions are made possible, colossal, un colossal undertakings are carried out. Through it, governments can run smoothly. Through this faculty, man enters into the very kingdom of God. You can't take the term human, and you cannot apply it to any being void of this faculty. This is really strange. Why would you be attempting to apply this to any being devoid of this faculty? And to be precise, what is this faculty he's talking about? It says it frees man from the animal nature, discerns the realities of things, and puts man in touch with God. It brings things from the invisible plane, from the invisible plane the, into the sciences and the arts. Inventions are made possible, colossal undertakings carried out, governments run smoothly. And through this faculty, man enters into the very kingdom of God. So, by extension, this would mean that if you met any biological organism, even though its lineage was different, but they could ponder things, they could bring things from the invisible plane through the sciences and the arts, they could make inventions, undertake colossal undertakings, and run their government smoothly, that that would be what? The kingdom of man. Nay, rather, the virtue of man is this that he can investigate the ideals of the kingdom and attain knowledge which is denied the animal in its limitation. The station of man is this, that he has the power to attain those ideals and thereby differentiate and consciously distinguish himself an infinite degree above the kingdoms of existence below him. The station of man is great, very great. God has created man after his own image and likeness. He has endowed him with a mighty power which is capable of discovering the mysteries of phenomena. Through its use, man is able to arrive at ideal conclusions, instead of being restricted to the mere plane of sense impressions. As he possesses sense endowment in common with the animals, it is evident that he is distinguished above them by his conscious power of penetrating abstract realities. He draws nearer to God. His heart is replete with the love of God. This is the foundation of the world of humanity. This is the image and likeness of God. This is the reality of man. Otherwise, he is just an animal. The vast majority of scientific theories and discoveries and understandings are not what we immediately access through our senses. We come up with theories of gravitation. We understand that we are circling around the sun. We understand whole facets of geological science, biological science, chemical sciences, physics, and a vast majority of this is not immediately apparent to us. We are distinguished above the animal kingdom by this conscious power, quote, of penetrating abstract realities. This is the reality of man, he ends. Otherwise, he is an animal. So without this capacity to reach out and penetrate the mysteries of the universe, we are animals. This is why in another place, Abdu'l-Baha states 
the higher an individual is within the sciences and the understanding of the world, the closer he is to the divine court, because it is rising above the simple material physical capacities of humankind and reaching out higher and higher and extending the range of our intellect. It cannot abstractly reason out anything. The animal cannot conceive of the earth being spherical or revolving upon its axis. It cannot apprehend that the little stars in the heavens are tremendous worlds vastly greater than the earth. The animal cannot abstractly conceive of intellect. Of these powers it is bereft. Therefore, these powers are peculiar to man, and it is made evident that in the human kingdom there is a reality of which the animal is lacking. What is that reality? It is the spirit of man. By it, man is distinguished above all other phenomenal kingdoms. Nobody believes <clears throat> that the, like a bonobo, right, or an orangutan, or a gorilla, our closest animal ancestors, is capable of conceiving of the earth being spherical and revolving around its axis. Cannot apprehend the little stars in the heavens are tremendous worlds. They are very, very much locked within their senses. They can extend their intellect, and we can actually help them do so. And yet, the difference between myself and a bonobo is unfathomably, unfathomably wide. They might be able to use sticks to take out termites, but they don't create large hadron colliders. In fact, it's interesting because there's a double irony in here because oftentimes I get into these discussions because this is really a, a discussion of taxonomy, of the arranging of the orders and structures of the biological world. And I, I've said, you know, sort of like spontaneously in the past, um, you know, I, I think we should take a little bit more serious consideration because we are attempting to create an accurate taxonomy of biological organisms, of kingdom animalia, of which we are a part, and I admit that. Yet at the same time, there, there, there seems a peculiar loop here because I think there should be a category, uh, like a taxonomical structure, a taxonomical hierarchy or a category, for beings that can make taxonomic categories. I don't think that the rest of the animals on our planet, rest of the animals, uh, themselves are going to come up with a periodic table of elements. I don't think they themselves are going to be actually differentiating between species, subspecies, genera, phyla, etc. There's, there's something very important here. The capacity of humankind is so unfathomably shocking. And the only reason we're not, if you will, so struck by it is because it is so unbelievably present in our day and age. Is Abdu'l-Baha's category of humanity a claim that we are not animals developed through the process of evolution? No. And I hope that's clear, at least by now. We know now from, I think, about 10 or 12 quotes that in each case, what Abdu'l-Baha is stating that makes us not animals is, quote, reasoning power, intelligence, power of the intellect, or ability to take colossal undertakings, run our governments effectively, and create technology that overcomes some of our fundamental physical limitations if we are only going by our physical bodies and our senses, which is why we can actually have <laughs> video and recordings and talk across the planet through phones. So I think what's important to note here is imagine, for example, we suddenly, this is how I understand this, if we suddenly found that there was, I don't know, an octopus-like creature underneath our own oceans, for example, or maybe it's on Europa, and that being itself had the power of the intellect, was able to actually understand, say we could understand its, you know, octopoidal language, and we find out that they have scientific theories, that they self-reflect, that they try and understand things, they might even be behind us, or in front of us, and they're trying to penetrate the mysteries of the universe, and use that to create, I don't know, little octopus bubbles that can go outside of the water and travel to different places. Uh, that's human, right? I, I, I think it's very easy to understand <clears throat> that if we suddenly 
arrived on a different planet and found a series of extraterrestrials, and that there was a whole, if you will, biological fauna all throughout that planet that we would actually be able to go through, oh, and that's kind of like a mouse, and that one, those are kind of like our bugs, right? And, and these are like, you know, Koro sort of like they're sort of like higher primates, and that's human. That thing over there is human. It's actually understanding things, it's actually meditative, it's actually striving to build political, social, and spiritual theories, if you will, ethical theories, and is expanding its intellect and has stepped out of the kingdom of the animal. I don't think that's actually peculiar at all. The distinctive virtue, or plus, of the animal is sense perception. It sees, hears, smells, tastes, and feels, but is incapable, in turn, of conscious ideation or reflection, which characterizes and differentiates the human kingdom. The animal neither exercises nor apprehends this distinctive human power and gift. From the visible, it cannot draw conclusions regarding the invisible, whereas the human mind from visible and known premises attains knowledge of the unknown and invisible. For instance, Christopher Columbus, from information based upon known and provable facts, drew conclusions which led him unerringly across the vast ocean to the unknown continent of America. Such power of accomplishment is beyond the range of animal intelligence. Therefore, this power is a distinctive attribute of the human spirit and kingdom. The animal spirit cannot penetrate and discover the mysteries of things. It is a captive of the senses. No amount of teaching, for instance, would enable it to grasp the fact that the sun is stationary and the earth moves around it. Likewise, the human spirit has its limitations. It cannot comprehend the phenomena of the kingdom transcending the human station, for it is a captive of powers and life forces which have their operation upon its own plane of existence, and it cannot go beyond that boundary. You might say, well, wait a minute, but an animal could become capable of understanding these scientific realities. You know, we have some you know, animals, I don't know, dolphins, for example, or bonobos, for that matter, who are beginning to understand things. We've had animals learn like sign language, and they are pushing actually these boundaries. Now, again, they don't create large hadron colliders or have chemical theories or geological theories. They don't have political organizations, etc. Yet, they seem to be that there are those which are far lower, uh, say cockroaches, sorry to cockroaches, and those that are higher, and let's say dolphins, octopuses, and bonobos. Now, you could say, <clears throat> but wait, these animals could become capable of understanding this. Yes, but then you've understood it wouldn't be an animal by Abdu'l-Baha's definition. We slowly evolved, as he stated. We slowly gathered different capacities until we stepped out of the animal kingdom and became human. That is the definition. And some of the docs of Abdu'l-Baha, he does state that man has always existed. And we're going to look at a passage. But I want to give a counter instance, because again, we're trying to be comprehensive with the quotes that we're using. So this is from some answer questions. The spirit of man has a beginning, but it has no end. It continues eternally. In the same way, the species existing on this earth are phenomenal, for it is established that there was a time when these species did not exist on the surface of the earth. Moreover, the earth has not always existed, but the world of existence has always been, for the universe is not limited to this terrestrial globe. If anyone tells you <laughs> the Baha'i writings state the mankind biologically has always existed, that is patently false. Abdu'l-Baha states very clearly that there was a time when the species didn't exist, and this planet didn't even exist. Okay? Why I started this as the statement, what is man, is because this is what has caused uh, a great deal of misunderstandings in people reading the Baha'i writings particularly the talks of Abdu'l-Baha. And it's because there are times when he is using the term man to refer to different things. We're going to look at a passage like this once again from some answered questions. 
The reflection of the divine perfections appears in the reality of man, so he is the representative of God, the messenger of God. If man did not exist, the universe would be without result, for the object of existence is the appearance of the perfections of God. Therefore, it cannot be said that there was a time when man was not. All that we can say is that this terrestrial globe at one time did not exist, and at its beginning, man did not appear upon it. But from the beginning which has no beginning to the end which has no end, a perfect manifestation always exists. This man of whom we speak is not every man. We mean the perfect man. For the noblest part of the tree is the fruit, which is the reason for its existence. If the tree had no fruit, it would have no meaning. Therefore, it cannot be imagined that the world of existence, whether the stars or this earth, were once inhabited by the donkey, cow, mouse, and cat, and that they were without man. Okay, so that sounds peculiar. <laughs> On the one hand, it sounds like he says, no, man has always existed, so we've always been here. At the exact same time, he says, we can say that the globe wasn't here, and at the beginning, man didn't appear on it. Because remember, according to Abdu'l-Baha in the passage we've really seen, mankind came to be through a series of successive stages by the process of evolution. That's what he stated. That was one of the, I think, the third quote we looked at. But then look at this. He says, But from the beginning which has no beginning to the end which has no end, a perfect manifestation has always existed. This man of whom we speak is not every man, we mean the perfect man. Okay, so this actually isn't even talking about biological organisms at all. We know that because he says that you can't say there was a time when man was not, but then it says there was a time when there was no planet and no species. So he's obviously using man in a different sense here, and I would propose he's in one way he is and one way he's not, because he is saying there has always been a conscious, self-reflecting, meditative, penetrating the mysteries of the universe being, and he's very clear, a perfect manifestation always exists. We're not speaking of every man, we mean the perfect man. That there has always been, in reality, a conscious agent, a an intellect. And again, this is, well, within religious texts, unequivocally clear. There has always been divine wisdom. There has always been the Logos. There has always been, in this case, the same meaning, the perfect manifestation of God. There has always been conscious reality within the cosmos. I would add here that, at the same time, the Baha'i readings seem to be very clear that there has, to make it simple uh, for now, throughout our multiverse, um, conscious beings. Here is gleanings from Baha'u'llah, so this is Baha'u'llah himself. As to thy question concerning the worlds of God, know thou of a truth that the worlds of God are countless in their number, and infinite in their range. None can reckon or comprehend them except God, the All-Knowing, the All-Wise. Verily I say, the creation of God embraceth worlds besides this world, and creatures apart from these creatures. In each of these worlds he hath ordained things which none can search except himself the all-searching, the all-wise. So, creatures capable of rational thought, the power of discovery, the ability to know their creative creator, have always existed according to the Baha'i writings. Thus, the perfect man has always existed, just as a king necessitates having subjects. Else he would not be a king. It is with such an understanding as this that I read quotes like the following. Now, if we imagine a time when man belonged to the animal world, or when he was merely an animal, we shall find that existence would have been imperfect. That is to say, there would have been no man, and this chief member, which in the body of the world is like the brain and mind in man, 
would have been missing. When we speak of man, we mean the perfect one, the foremost individual in the world, who is the sum of spiritual and apparent perfections, and who is like the sun among the beings. So this is one of those quotes that has been cited to me multiple times that has been the source of this confusion, where I meet Baha'is um, who claim that mankind was never an animal and that <clears throat> we've always been here. Now it's interesting, he says, now if we imagine a time when man belonged to the animal world or was merely an animal, we shall find that existence would have been imperfect. That is to say, there would have been no man. Interesting. And the chief member would have been missing. But then he says again, when we speak of man, we mean the perfect one, the foremost individual in the world, the sum of spiritual and apparent perfections, and it was like the sun among beings. This is a manifestation of God. So if we start expanding this out, so we have, it's not a biological definition, it's talking about rational and func functional capacities of beings, which could also be octopoids, <laughs> right? And that there has always been within reality a supreme perfect entity, and I would suggest others, that have conscious ideation, they have the power of meditation, they have the power of rational discovery, and this is often the case where certain passages that we're looking at from Abdu'l-Baha, what he's actually talking about is manifestations of God. Given the majority of humankind suffers greatly, and our intellects and our hearts, moral and intellectual beings, can alleviate that suffering, and that each day the world continues in a state of profound oppression, where bodies are crushed, minds are oppressed, there's little wonder why Abdu'l-Baha chastises the neglect of the things of the mind. So I offer you this passage, because again it relates to the irony of this topic. Although in the past all the great spiritual teachers have arisen in the East, there are still many men there who are quite devoid of spirituality. With regard to the things of the spirit, they are as lifeless as a stone. Nor do they wish to be otherwise, for they consider that man is only a higher form of animal, and that the things of God concern him not. But man's ambition should soar above this. He should ever look higher than himself, ever upward and onward, until, through the mercy of God, he may come to the kingdom of heaven. Again, there are men whose eyes are only open to physical progress and to the evolution of the world of matter. These men prefer to study the resemblance between their own physical body and that of the ape, rather than to contemplate the glorious affiliation between their spirit and that of God. This is indeed strange, for it is only physically that man resembles the lower creation. With regard to his intellect, he is totally unlike it. The power of the intellect is one of God's greatest gifts to men. It is the power that makes him a higher creature than the animal. For whereas, century by century and age by age, man's intelligence grows and becomes keener, that of the animal remains the same. They are no more intelligent today than they were a thousand years ago. Is there a greater proof than this needed to show man's dissimilarity to the animal creation? It is surely as clear as day. We shouldn't be only open to physical progress, which means physical progress has happened, and the evolution in the world of matter, which means the, our evolution through the world of matter has happened. What he's concerned with is our focus. He says these men prefer to study the resemblance between their own physical body and that of the ape, rather than to contemplate the glorious affiliation between their spirit and that of God. And it is strange because, quote, only physically man resembles the lower creation. With regard to his intellect, he is totally unlike it. Right? Why I say again there's, a, there's this, this has to do with that irony is because you have these individuals who are actually studying our physical resemblance to the other uh, members of the primate family. And they're looking at us and saying, well, we're no different. The irony again is because we are different. We're the kind of creatures that will actually study other primates. 
They weren't even the kinds of creatures able to do social experiments on them and try to understand what their motivations are and will try and protect their habitats. Um, and this is true of everything else. We will also study chemical theory and we'll build taxonomies to understand the different order of biological organisms, on and on and on and on. The very act of the individual doing this is doing something that that thing can't do. And Abdu'l-Baha is simply trying to get us to see how profound and exquisitely beautiful that is and how it actually does distinguish us. He finishes here, the power of the intellects is one of God's greatest gifts to men. It is the power that makes him higher than the animal. So Abdu'l-Baha here isn't against studying resemblances between our bodies and those of apes. And please understand this, that's not what he's saying. It's to those who, with regards to the life of the spirit, our spiritual and ethical evolution, and our own intellect, are lifeless as a stone, because they're open only to physical progress and to the evolution of matter. And it's important because when you actually look at human evolution, say just over the last couple thousand years, we have made leaps and leaps and leaps and bounds evolutionarily, but not really in the world of our physical bodies. It has really been intellectual and social evolution. If you will, our political and economic and social resource packages, our theories and understandings that have changed the face of the entire globe. The scientific revolution is not a process of material evolution or physical evolution only. It is actually an intellectual evolution and revolution. And Abdu'l-Baha is trying to get us to see that that really matters. That that really matters. That is again why I say it's ironic, because people will say, well, Abdu'l-Baha himself has no respect for modern day science. He's actually going against scientific findings. When in actual fact, he's, he's not doing that at all. He's saying, no, look at your scientific findings. Understand that you do that. And that is something that which is the absolute, like, if you will, crown of humanity. That is actually what defines us as the king of the jungle and the desert <laughs> and the oceans. It's because that's truly what makes us human, as it would any other organism. This is why he said earlier, any being devoid of these faculties. He didn't, he didn't say any hominid. He didn't say any primate. He said, any being devoid of these cannot be called human. This section is called the stages from man, lowercase m, to man, uppercase m. So, the process of humankind's ascension from our animal state to the human state is a central concept of all the religions of God. And it sheds further light as well on the concept of human. The human kingdom. This passage is from the selections of the writings of Abdu'l. The suckling babe passeth through various physical stages, growing and developing at every stage until its body reacheth the age of maturity. Having arrived at this stage, it acquireth the capacity to manifest spiritual and intellectual perfections. The lights of comprehension, intelligence, and knowledge become perceptible in it and the powers of its soul unfold. Similarly, in the contingent world, the human species hath undergone progressive physical changes and, by a slow process, hath scaled the ladder of civilization, realizing in itself the wonders, excellencies, and gifts of humanity in their most glorious form until it gained the capacity to express the splendors of spiritual perfections and divine ideals, and become capable of hearkening to the call of God. Then, at last, the call of the kingdom was raised, the spiritual virtues and perfections were revealed, the sun of reality dawned, and the teachings of the most great peace, of the oneness of the world of humanity, and of the universality of men, were promoted. Please, if you get the chance, read this quote again. So he gives this analogy of the suckling babe, of a child who is growing and developing. He then takes this analogy and he looks at the human species. 
Similarly, the human species hath undergone progressive physical changes. And, by a slow process, scaled the ladder of civilization. Realizing in itself the wonders, excellencies, and gifts of humanity. Okay, so it went under, underwent slow physical changes. And there came a point, <coughs> excuse me, where humanity began to scale by a slow process the ladder of civilization. Where we began to realize excellencies and gifts of our potentiality. And then it says, until it gained the capacity to express the splendors of spiritual perfections and divine ideals and to hearken unto the call of God. So we had this process, not to you know beat a dead horse here, but we had us moving through all the kingdoms, through a process of evolution, with slow physical changes, until we came to a place where we then began on the, the, to scale the ladder of civilization. So we are animal. And then we began to slow, by a slow process, actually scale the ladder of civilization, slowly, slowly realizing the capacities that we have, expanding our intellects, more deeply understanding things, until it gained the capacity to express the spiritual perfections. Now, and then it says, then at last the call of the kingdom was raised. So in a weird sense, we were biological animals. And then we became, if you will, semi-civilized man, and then more civilized man. And then we slowly, as humankind began to ascend, we realized, reached this slowly reached this point where we began to really sort of penetrate the mysteries of the universe and begin to actually live out lives of honesty and dignity and justice and to bring those into, remember, organizing our governments and taking on different value sets and different, if you will, perceptions of beauty and virtue and began to come in this and then it says, then at last the kingdom. At last the call of the kingdom of God was raised to when finally we were brought into larger and larger faith communities until, from a Baha'i perspective, we will come to that place when the planet itself will become one. And it's interesting, even in that context, I don't have the passage here, but it's from Promulgation of Universal Peace, where Abdul Baha says, once we become united, once we finally truly understand, understood the oneness of humankind and we have joined together, he actually says, that the sciences of this day will become the playthings of children. And that might sound shocking to some people, but actually the sciences of the 19th century look very much like the playthings of children to us. And our evolution, which is not biologically based, it's conceptually based, it's the rational faculty of humankind and our ability to organize economies and societies, etc., and understand the mysteries of the universe, is actually exponentially jumping. We're evolving rapidly, technologically and evolutionarily, although in some sense, spiritually, we still have far to go. But these things will, once we finally become united, become the playthings of children again. This next section is called The Appearance of Man, that's the major section. Our first part is, man is an emergent property, according to the Baha'i writings. Moreover, these members, these elements, this composition, which are found in the organism of man, are an attraction and magnet for the spirit. It is certain that the spirit will appear in it. So a mirror which is clear will certainly attract the rays of the sun. It will become luminous, and wonderful images will appear in it. That is to say, when these existing elements are gathered together according to the natural order and with perfect strength, they become a magnet for the spirit, and the spirit will become manifest in them with all its perfections. Under these conditions, it cannot be said, what is the necessity for the rays of the sun to descend upon the mirror? For the connection which exists between the reality of things, whether they be spiritual or material, requires that when the mirror is clear and faces the sun, the light of the sun must become apparent in it. 
In the same way, when the elements are arranged and combined in the most glorious system, organization and manner, the human spirit will appear and be manifest in them. This is the decree of the powerful, the wise. Just like at the beginning of the universe, th there was no water, <laughs> right? Until a proper combination of hydrogen and oxygen came together, we suddenly had the properties of water, which are neither the properties of hydrogen or oxygen. That is an emergent property. It has to do with the composition and the arrangement of certain, certain elements, which in reality, if you think about it, all of the elements of the periodic table are themselves emergent properties. They are not the properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons. They are actually something that comes about through the organization and structure of them. And that humankind itself is like this. He says that this organism of man, and we've seen the definition of human kingdom or the human spirit, that when they're when they're arranged just so, it is capable of reflecting the human capacities. That's why I was saying previously it is a functional definition. Because is it in the sense that we're stating that this is the only combination and the only arrangement of these elements that can actually produce this intellect? No, we've seen that previously. That it's that these there are many different conscious beings from the perspective of the Baha'i writings. So we have a biological man at first, which we know emerges through a long, slow process of physical changes and evolution from the animal kingdom. And as that form becomes per perfected, we begin to see rational man. And this really is exactly what we already believe today, <laughs> that mankind was an animal and physically still is an animal. But that some time ago, <laughs> humankind began to say, understand tools, be, under, be able to think about their world, to self-reflect, and to slowly, slowly develop through that gradual process, and then began to ascend the ladder of civilization. Um, again, Abdul Baha states this in some answered questions. Finally, the perfection of each individual being, that is to say, the perfection which you now see in man or apart from him, with regard to their atoms, members, or powers, is due to the composition of the elements, to their measure, to their balance, to the mode of their combination, and to mutual influence. When all these are gathered together, then man exists. And remember, we saw that this happened according to a natural order, slow process, evolution, physical changes, that it's all within this one cosmos, this one ultimate, you know, physical cosmos with natural order and natural law, that when these, co these elements are composed, and they are brought into this type of arrangement, and then it's capable of reflecting the capacity of rational thought. By a divine power of creation, the elements assemble together in affinity, and the result is a composite being. Certain of these elements have united, and man has come into existence. Certain other combinations produce plants and animals. Therefore, this affinity of the inanimate elements is the cause of life and being. Through their commingling, therefore, human affinity, love, and fellowship are made possible. If the elements were not assembled together in affinity to produce the body of man, the higher intelligent forces could not be manifest in the body. But when these elements separate, when their affinity and cohesion are overcome, death and dissolution of the body they have built inevitably follow. Therefore, Affinity and unity among even these material elements mean life in the body of man, and their discord and disagreement mean death. Throughout all creation, in all the kingdoms, this law is written, that love and affinity are the cause of life, and discord and separation are the cause of death. Consider the bodies of all the natural organisms. Certain elements have gathered and combined in chemical affinity. The tree, the man, the fish, are due to this attraction and cohesion which have brought the elements together. A composition or composite being has resulted. The outcome of certain atomic grouping, for instance, is a mirror, table, or clock, because a cohesive power has magnetized and bound these atoms together. When that attracting power is withdrawn, dissolution 
and disintegration follow. No mirror, table, or clock remain. No trace. No existence. Therefore, commingling of the atoms brings forth a reality, while dispersion or dissemination of them is equivalent to non-existence. So we already believe that there was a time when there was no life on the planet. Abdu'l-Baha has stated that these species did not exist, and that there was even a time when this terrestrial globe did not exist, but that there was this affinity, if you will, of the inanimate elements that was the cause, and again, according to natural order, an affinity of the inanimate elements that caused life in being. Life and being. And it says, if the elements were not assembled together in an affinity to produce the body of man, the higher intel intelligent forces could not be manifest in the body. So we needed this first combination, which was the power of life itself. That there was an affinity within the elements themselves that were inanimate, that composed to create life, and that these if these elements were then composed differently, if their arrangement and organization and balance, as it was stated in the quote previously, to their measure, balance, mode of their combination into mutual influence, then you had the power of growth, and then you had the power of sense understanding, the definition of the animal kingdom, and that when they came together in a higher, higher level composition, then it could reflect the spirit of man and they could not be manifest without this fundamental composition of lower elements. So the foundation, the physical form, is prior and is essential for the emergence of conscious entities. But I think pretty much everyone believes that. We, the term uh, philosophically, is supervene. We, the rational faculty, is itself dependent upon the anatomy and the physical, biological structure and chemical affinity and composition of the elements of a body in order for it to manifest. Yet that does not mean that it's not real. That is the reality of what humankind is, and were we to find that capacities or that group of capacities within an organism that has no biological lineage like common with our own, I would still say, well, basically they're human. And that is what Abdu'l-Baha is saying. The virtues of humanity are many, but science is the most noble of them all. The distinction which man enjoys above and beyond the station of the animal is due to this paramount virtue. It is a bestowal of God. It is not material. It is divine. Science is an effulgence of the sun of reality, the power of investigating and discovering the verities of the universe, the means by which man finds a pathway to God. All the powers and attributes of man are human and hereditary in origin, outcomes of nature's processes, except the intellect, which is supernatural. Through intellectual and intelligent inquiry, science is the discoverer of all things. It unites present and past, reveals the history of bygone nations and events, and confers upon man today the essence of all human knowledge and attainment throughout the ages. By intellectual processes and logical deductions of reason, this superpower in man can penetrate the mysteries of the future and anticipate its happenings. Science is the first emanation from God toward man. All created beings embody the potentiality of material perfection, but the power of intellectual investigation and scientific acquisition is a higher virtue specialized to man alone. Other beings and organisms are deprived of this potentiality and attainment. God has created or deposited this love of reality in man. The development and progress of a nation is according to the measure and degree of that nation's scientific attainments. Through this means, its greatness is continually increased, and day by day the welfare and prosperity of its people are assured. All blessings are divine in origin, but none can be compared with this power of intellectual investigation and research, which is an eternal gift producing fruits of un ending delight. Man is ever partaking of these fruits, 
All other blessings are temporary. This is an everlasting possession. Even sovereignty has its limitations and overthrow. This is a kingship and dominion which none may usurp or destroy. Briefly, it is an eternal blessing and divine bestowals, the supreme gift of God to man. Therefore, you should put forward your most earnest efforts toward the acquisition of science and arts. The greater your attainment, the higher your standard in the divine purpose. The man of science is perceiving and endowed with vision, whereas he who is ignorant and neglectful of this development is blind. The investigating mind is attentive, alive. The callous and indifferent mind is deaf and dead. A scientific man is a true index and representative of humanity, for through processes of inductive reasoning and research, he is informed of all that appertains to humanity, its status, conditions, and happenings. He studies the human body politic, understands social problems, and weaves the web and texture of civilization. In fact, science may be likened to a mirror, wherein the infinite forms and images of existing things are revealed and reflected. It is the very foundation of all individual and national development. Without this basis of investigation, development is impossible. Therefore, seek with diligent endeavor the knowledge and attainment of all that lies within the power of this wonderful bestowal. The ideal faculties of man, including the capacity for scientific acquisition, are beyond nature's ken. These are powers whereby man is differentiated and distinguished from all other forms of life. This is the bestowal of divine idealism, the crown adorning human heads. Notwithstanding the gift of this supernatural power, it is most amazing that materialists still consider themselves within the bonds and captivity of nature. We have seen this theme, the larger theme, once again brought up. Science is the most noble virtue of humankind. The distinction that man enjoys above and beyond the station of the animal is due to this paramount virtue. Again, he's trying to focus us back again on this functional capacity of humankind. Whereas the other attributes of man are hereditary in origin, the outcome of nature's processes, except the intellect, which is supernatural. And this is very interesting that we find within the Baha'i writings. The term supernatural itself seems to have a radically different meaning. I'm not sure, forgive me if I have a quote in this quote bank, because he actually states that humankind are supernatural to animals, which are supernatural to plants, which are supernatural, to minerals. It's because, from the perspective of the mineral, because you can't have a perspective, there is, in some sense, no growth, no sense organs, and no rational faculty of scientific penetration that it has any access to. So it is above its nature. Likewise, the, the idea if one could have a fern could have such a thing of sight and of sound and you know what I mean of smell and of taste are completely nonsensical, inaccessible really, to the plant. The animal itself, I've often made the, you know this comment that if I'm sitting there, I actually have two dogs and two cats for that matter, and I'm standing around them doing a talk like this. Actually, my dogs are just over there. And they have no access whatsoever to anything that I'm saying unless I say walk, ball, food through the conditioning of those patterns. They couldn't understand anything if I'm talking about the most simplest and mundane concepts. They can't understand even something is like possibly Matt might come, Matt's my friend, might come tomorrow for a cup of coffee. That entire array of concepts is inaccessible to them. It is supernatural. And because this capacity, which is dependent upon the prior existence of the physical organism that can actually manifest 
this emergent property is written into the very laws of the universe, it is supernatural from that sense. And this is important to note. Uh, the laws of the universe that we live in are obviously such that the potentiality for a conscious being who reflects upon the sciences and religion and who can actually utilize <laughs> uh, technological devices to communicate to you was possible within the laws of nature from the beginning, or else I couldn't be talking to you right now. So yes, all of these fundamental structures have to be there. Remember he mentioned like the clock and the watch, etc., and the mirror. They have to be there and to be composed of the physical elements and arranged in such a perfect way, or in such a way that those qualities, like the quality of a, of a camera, can actually manifest, just like the rational faculty of man, who once manifested, can then penetrate the mysteries of the universe and draw out secrets like a video recorder or build the internet for that matter. It is here that uh, I mentioned this earlier, where Abdu'l Baha states, the greater your attainment, because he says, you should put forward your most earnest efforts towards the acquisition of sciences and arts. The greater your attainment, the higher your standard in the divine purpose. This is fascinating. The greater your attain attainment in the sciences and the arts, the higher your standard in the divine purpose. He says, a scientific man is a true index and representative of humanity. For through processes of inductive reasoning and research, he is informed of all that appertains to humanity, its status, conditions, happenings. He studies the human body politic, understands social problems, and weaves the web and texture of civilization. So this supreme gift to God, sorry, the supreme gift of God to humankind is this rational faculty that enables us to use inductive reasoning, as I've proposed ahead, to actually gather facts and penetrate and see beyond our sense impressions. And this makes, the reason why a scientific man is a true index of humanity is because that is the definition that Abdul Baha uses for humanity. This is once again, why I state that there is a peculiar irony. Over and over and over in my interactions on Fireside, which is our Baha'i conversations with members not of the Baha'i faith, or in social conversations, or what I've seen online where Abdu Baha is being castigated for his lack of respect for science, is that the very fundamental point Abdu Baha is trying to make is we're not paying enough attention to the scientific capacity of humankind. That when we only look at the physical progress or of our bodies, or only the material progress, or, and we are only interested and focused on our physical relationship with other primates, because we are a primate, then we're missing the very foundation of what humankind is. That's why it's ironic, because he's saying, no, you're saying that you're not, <coughs> I am not properly represent, properly respecting or honoring the scientific achievements of humankind. But my point is you're not properly respecting or honoring the scientific achievements of humankind because you think we're like everything else. So I've talked about octopoids, octopoids <laughs> from the Europa, the moon of Jupiter. And I stated that were we to encounter these capacities in another organism, that would be human. I said, this is my understanding of what Abdul Baha says. I offer you the next quote from some answered questions. As the perfection of man is entirely due to the composition of the atoms of the elements, to their measure, to the method of their combination, and to the mutual influence and action of the different beings, then, since man was produced ten or a hundred thousand years ago from these earthly elements with the same measure and balance, the same method of combination and mingling, and the same influence of the other beings, Exactly the same man existed then as now. This is evident and not worth debating. 
A thousand million years hence, if these elements of man are gathered together and arranged in this special proportion, and if the elements are combined according to the same method, and if they are affected by the same influence of other beings, exactly the same man will exist. For example, if after a hundred thousand years there is oil, fire, a wick, a lamp, and the lighter of the lamp, briefly, if there are all the necessaries which now exist, exactly the same lamp will be obtained. Okay, some people will be like, well, obviously it's not, it's a different lamp. Yes, it's a different lamp, structurally, right? It's physical instantiation, it's physical embodiment would be different, but it's still a lamp. And why I say this is obvious emergence, because he's saying, okay, so just so you don't misunderstand me, if 100,000 years ago this happened, and you actually had the combination of elements, right, where the rational faculty of humankind, the human kingdom came into being, where that being could penetrate the laws, or, or uncover the laws of the universe, penetrate the mysteries of existence, create amazing inventions, etc., 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 that's a man. Now, obviously, a one billion years from now organism capable of meditation, self-reflection, scientific discovery, and moral, ethical, and social development isn't the biological lineage of humankind that Abdul Baha is talking about. He's talking about a set of functional capacities that are grounded in a biological, chemical, physics structure capable of reflecting those capacities. So obviously we're discussing, I think it's eminently clear that Abdu'l-Baha is stating, no, once again, you're misunderstanding what I mean by human. What I mean by human are these sets of capacities and ideal virtues. And this universe is capable of producing it. And wherever it produces it, if you find those qualities, that's the human kingdom. In case there was any uh, residual doubt on this, humankind obviously can be instantiated, embodied in very various different physical forms. By that I mean non-terrestrial. This is a quote from Shoghi Effendi, actually, from the Light of Divine Guidance, not Lights of Guidance, the, the compilation, but the Light of Divine Guidance, Volume 2. Abdu'l-Baha stated there are other worlds than ours, which are inhabited by beings capable of knowing God. If there are other entities capable of knowing God, and again we walk through that process, there was no, there was no, no terrestrial globe, there were no species, and then the commingling of inanimate elements gave life, and then actually went through the capacity for growth and for sense uh, uh, <laughs> sensorial capacities, and then suddenly began to actually be able to meditate and self-reflect and think on things and, by a slow process, scale the ladder of civilization, that they then begin to understand, uh, sorry, un unravel or unearth the capacities that they actually have, those ideal virtues, until the call of God can come. That was one of our previous quotes, that they are then then capable of knowing God. That is after the fact. We were have gone through this massively long process where we were already slowly becoming civilized before that became our capacity. Then these inhabited beings capable of knowing God on other worlds are human. They are functionally defined emergent properties. So obviously they're not gene genealogically human. That much is clear. Does it make sense when we find in the recorded talks of Abdu'l-Baha that he says this. How is it possible to conceive that these stupendous stellar bodies are not inhabited? Verily, they are peopled. But let it be known that the dwellers accord with the elements of their respective spheres. These living beings do not have states of consciousness like unto those who live on the surface of this globe. The power of adaptation and environment molds their bodies and states of consciousness, just as our bodies and minds are suited to our planet. 
Beings who inhabit those distant luminous bodies are attuned to the elements that have gone into their composition of their respective spheres. So this is actually a, a quote from a talk in a previous publication called Divine Philosophy. How is it possible to conceive the stupendous stellar bodies are not inhabited? And he says, verily, they are peopled. And it's interesting. There's a series of things that have to do with evolutionary theory in this quote. The dwellers accord the elements of their respective spheres. Naturally, the elements that would make up their physical animal bodies would be different. And then he says, they do not have states of consciousness like unto those who live on the surface of this globe. So their states of consciousness are different than ours. And then it says, <clears throat> the power of adaptation and environment molds their bodies in states of consciousness just as our bodies and minds are suited to our planet. So we've already heard that Abdu Baha has stated we went through a process of evolution. The term is actually used. Um, we've seen how we've had slow, gradual physical changes. And that we are included in this quote, that there is the power of adaptation and environment. And there's this interplay between adaptation and environment that molds our states of consciousness just as our bodies and minds. There is, there's nothing uh, disconcerting here at all. That's what we currently believe. That there is our adap adaptive, our, our adaptations are having an interplay with the environment in which we are in, which molds our state of consciousness and our bodies to be suited to certain ecological niches. And that's what Abdul Baha is stating. And once again, there are beings capable of knowing God who are adapted with different states of consciousness, but are still have all of these capacities, so therefore they are human. So the Baha'i faith, to a great extent, sees the human reality be states of consciousness, a set of capacities and functions, that can be realized in entirely different forms at entirely different times within the historical timeline of our universe, a billion years hence. Further, the process of the creation of these forms is according to a natural system of adaptation to their <coughs> specific biological niches, and simply put, this certainly sounds quite familiar. This is where we run up into this challenge of, because the Baha'i Faith clearly states that human consciousness and capacities can be embodied or in, realized in multiple physical substructures. This is what makes it so challenging from the Baha'i perspective, and I think just intellectually, if you believe there is even the capacity or possibility of healing beings, to reduce those sets of capacities simply to the physical structure of humankind. And this is something that uh, has an unwieldy name in modern philosophy, it's called uh, multiple realizability. So multiple realizability means that you have something which is functionally defined, right? And <clears throat> that thing can be realized within multiple physical mediums and multiple physical realizations or structures. So there's simpler examples of this. One would be money. Um, so for example, I live in Canada and if you were to say what is five dollars, for example, in Canadian money, um, I could hand you a five dollar bill. I say, well, this is five dollars, and then you say, well, is like the paper? So you start studying the physics of the papers. So you start looking at pulp and ink and dye, trying to find where the five dollars is, and you're studying it and you're studying it. And I, then all of a sudden, I drop what we call five loonies, which are one dollar coins. And you're like, well, that can't be $5 because those are metal and they're circular and they are not flammable. And this over here is flammable and paper, right, with ink on it that doesn't have any ink. When you started looking at the physical substrate, you can look like with the human brain at actually how the 
Five dollars is represented symbolically or encoded within that piece of paper, but that isn't the five dollars itself. Another example would be a thermometer. These are common uh, examples often used within the concept of multiple realizability. What is a thermometer? Well, a thermometer is anything that measures heat. It's not a definitive, oh, it has to be mercury in a glass vial. Well, what about a laser thermometer? And what about an alcohol thermometer? A thermometer is that which measures heat. Uh, it's functionally defined, so you can realize a <laughs> if you will, a thermometer in multiple different physical substructures, and it's still a thermometer. It's its function that defines us. If I'm doing mathematical computation within my mind, or you're seeing it done on a computer, or I'm using an abacus, or I'm using spools of, of paper in an, in an older computer, or I'm using digital, um, if I'm using my fingers or rocks, <laughs> in each case, uh, uh, computation or calculation can be happening, and it's not the physical structure that's actually carrying that defines it, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, if I take, for example, a book, uh, I use this in another context, but say I take Einstein's 1905 paper on special relativity, and I actually take that paper, right? And I write it on a piece of physical paper, right? It is now, you know, square and it's flammable and it's ink and it's pulp and it, you know, weighs, you know, a couple grams, <laughs> right? It's it's square, etc. Now I could take that exact same paper and I could grab a bowling ball and I could use a little scribe, and I could scribe out the entirety of Einstein's 1905 paper on a bowling ball. Now for me to say that Einstein's paper is black, spherical, heavy, and not flammable, and it's also rectangular, light, flammable, and made of pulp, not resin, is missing the point of what <coughs> Einstein's 1905 paper is. Einstein's 1905 paper is a set of ideas, a set of concepts and arguments that are about our reality and that explain it, right? And it is a well-reasoned, cogent, or parsimonious explanation of reality, and bowling balls can't be cogent. Paper can't be well reasoned. It is actually the abstract concepts that are encoded on it. Okay, I could then take that off the bowling ball and I could actually carve it in the side of a tree. I can make an alphabet out of insects and actually write it out on my garage floor. And in each case, Einstein's 905 paper isn't the insects, it isn't the bowling ball. It isn't the tree trunk, it isn't the paper, it isn't the digital code. It is that which is embodied, and it needs to be embodied in something physically. In a sense, I could then take that same, <clears throat> excuse me, I could take that same paper, no pun intended here, his 1905 theory, and I could write it in Arabic or Mandarin, I could, you know, put it into Swahili, I could put it into Urdu, and in each case, a translator's job is actually to maintain the propositional and conceptual content through the valley of the different languages. It's because you cannot reduce it to its phonetic substructure. So I offer these because this is really the concept that is being presented. The bowling ball, the paper, the bowling ball is an octopoid. We are actually a piece of physical paper. Some other entity might be a tree trunk. <laughs> By this I mean that it is these functional capacities, right, that are being embedded in a physical form or realized in a physical form, but they are not 
held to or bound to that physical structure. Because they're functional, or in this case of the case of Einstein's paper, they are abstract, they can be represented over and over and over and over again in multiple substrates. Like Abdu'l-Baha states that actually you can have a different planet that has different elements, that brings together an arrangement of elements that have this in, in, to have this affinity and cohesion, which gives rise to life, etc., etc., all the way up the ladder of civilization until you have a conscious being capable of knowing God on a different planet one billion years from now, but it's still human.